perhaps because of the military history associated with the Royal Navy, it is generally assumed that Portsmouth was the port of embarkation for the Allied armies during World War II. But it was Southampton's history as the trooping port as far back as the Boer War, and the features that make it a cruise centre even today, that led the US Army to use it as their home base, with their headquarters in a wing of the Civic Centre, with a British and Commonwealth Army Combined Movement Control Centre in the South Western Hotel, codenamed HMS Shrapnel, that led Major General Sir Nigel Holmes to say in 1945 that without Southampton we could not have done D-Day. Lord Lovett's memoirs, called March Past, provide a soldier's insight into the role of the port during this period. When the Normandy landings drew near, it was recognised that a large number of commando forces would be needed to operate under a single command, and so Lord Lovett was promoted to brigadier and given charge of the 1st Special Service Brigade, that was later to be known as the 1st Commando Brigade. I was visiting the brigade headquarters overnight when the embarkation signal flashed over England. Top priority from movement control, southern command. The message was short and to the point. Commandos will be collected and moved under separate arrangements at 0600 hours as detailed, proceeding to C-18 Transit Camp, Southampton. Acknowledge and alert all units concerned. Brigade headquarters was waiting, packed and ready. Dispatch riders roared out of town with sealed orders for commanding officers. The wheels of invasion began to turn. Our waterproof jeeps had already gone ahead, loaded into ships for France. The rear party took over files and switchboard. John Cowdray gave me breakfast before departure. The fighting men had far to travel, and there was time to say goodbye to Rosie, my wife, and the children. Then the convoy roared. In Southampton, the holiday spirit prevailed. There was a naffy run by American GI selling confectionery and soft drinks. There was also a cinema tent and enough space for football played in gym shoes, Hyde Park style, and stump cricket. Ropes were obtained to provide a Tarzan course among the treetops. Officers busied themselves with final arrangements and the checkups that slave lives. Dinghies were inflated, bayonets sharpened, automatic springs tested, magazines oiled, waterproof wrapping wound around all weapons, escape maps were issued with ammunition, rations and first aid kits. Hand grenades were not primed until the day of departure. The intelligence section made a sand table to supplement air photographs showing half-hidden details of enemy fortifications, wire and suspected minefields. Place, named and destinations were withheld until embarkation, but Frenchmen of number 10 Inter-Ally Commando identified the destinations at a glance. Sappers and signals attended to the mysteries of their trade. The briefings were a formality. Everybody knew his job. The sun shone. There were no parades. After breakfast roll call, some PT, a foxhole dig-or-die competition, a rifle inspection before lunch, and then the day was clear. But the British enjoyed this get-together of old friends. It was their last relaxation before weeks in the front line. On Sunday, René de Nouroy, his decorations a splash of colour on a white surplice, said mass for 300 men kneeling on the grass. At the interdominational church parade, a favourite hymn that has since become our own was sung with feeling, Eternal Father, strong to save, O oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. In the right mood, soldiers appreciate a word of encouragement, but not a lecture as seconds get out of the ring. The commandos were no exception as professionals. They knew the score, and with that knowledge did not accept half-truths or doubtful leadership. It was mutual trust that raised them above themselves in the encounter. Now, on the start line, something was expected, and I faced a critical audience. What I said took two minutes. It was simple enough, the message plain. I weighed each word, then drove it home, concentrating on the task ahead and simple facts, how to pace the battle, which in the event came true. First I spoke in English, then in colloquial French. The English version was different. I touched on past achievements, then congratulated the commanders 
for being chosen to fight together for the first time as a brigade, a proper striking force. The fine cutting edge of the BEF, they knew their ability from past experience. They could expect a physical encounter in which they had no equal. The greater the opportunity, the greater our chances of success. They knew their job. I knew they would not fail. Put it this way, the bigger the challenge, the better we play. With time to unwind before touchdown, now the parcel was in the post and out of my hands. C'est le jeu, le jeu de la libération. The paling star spelt our invasion. It was getting light enough to see Curtis now with his steel helmet on, 20 miles from the coast and 12 to lowering point. He shouted against the wind. I nodded respectfully, trying a shivering smile with eyes on the duffel coat. The navigator had done his job well on course and ahead of the clock. Nautical twilight was past and the sea changing colour to oyster shell in the grey dawn when the eldest lamp blinkered on our port bow. Good morning, commandos, and the best of British luck. Curtis and his yeoman spelt out the signal. We made a suitable reply. Thanks. Think we are going to bloody well need it. Rupert ran up his battle ensign. War was becoming personal again. At 5.30, 100 hours, war spite and ramillies opened fire. The men came up from below to stretch legs and seasick soldiers gulped in fresh air. The cruiser Forbisher joined the battleships on our port quarter. Muzzle blasts from the turrets of the ironclads lit the dawn with a yellow glare as 15-inch guns hurled their one-ton shells into the batteries round Le Havre. The fearsome salvos screamed over like trains coming out of a tunnel. Thoughts turned to the inner man. Commandos carried 48 hours rations and I ordered those who could swallow to eat breakfast. Hot ships cocoa and oily sardines. I can still smell them on my fingers. No rum ration was issued to my HQ. It was thought to be bad for the wind in the forthcoming marathon. Judging by the crumps on sword, eight miles ahead, the Germans were taking a pasting. But there again, the battery area in Oosterham, number four commando's objective, escaped with little damage. The blitz ended before the coastline hove in sight. Desultory firing continued as destroyers closed the range in an attempt to deal with closer gun flashes. Relative silence cast an ominous chill as we blew May West up, checked safety catches and strapped on equipment. Fire would soon be flying in the opposite direction. The lowering position, later be more crowded than Piccadilly Circus, appeared empty except for one policeman on patrol. The launchers passed close to her bows. Rupert's battle pennant snapping in the wind. The run-in took 40 minutes. At the lowering position we changed formation, the flotilla divided into equal flights, landing 10 minutes apart. I did not want the whole brigade boiling on the beach at the same time. Our own approach, which had the legs of the field, relied on speed rather than protection. The thin skins of three-ply wooden hulls did not stop machine-gun bullets, and we knew it. As a precaution against trouble, had divided headquarters with Max in charge of the other party. I'm going in, said Curtis. He gunned his engines and bumped over the shallows. Stand by with the ramps. Four able seamen sprang to the gangways. Lower away there, and the bows ran sweetly down at a steep angle. The command craft had a comfortable landing. On these occasions, a senior officer stepping cautiously rather than attempting a headlong dive is first off the boat. Surprisingly, it is as safe as a place as any. The water was knee deep when Piper Millen struck up blue bonnets, keeping the pipes going as he played the commandos up the beach. It was not a place to hang about in and we stood not on the order of our going. That eruption of 1,200 men covered the sand in record time as we ran up the slope, tearing the waterproof bandages off weapons. The old man fell, but swift reaction saved casualties. Ryan Price, sunk at sea, was as good a soldier as he is now a racehorse trainer. After swimming ashore, he re-equipped his troop with the small arms of the East Yorkshire Battalion picked off the beach as his men dashed on. Michael delivered good news. The Orme bridges 
had been seized intact. 